Welcome back to another episode of Grizzly True Crime. My name is Gisela Kay, and today we continue to deep dive Brian Laundrie's notepad. I do like how we're calling it a notepad now, because we did all expect a notebook. And what we got, what was released, what was shown was this little spiral notepad. So we're going to continue to deep dive it. We've done page one and page two already. Uh, today we're going to look at his description of what is the crime scene, unfortunately. So trigger warning, this content is, of course, for adults only, and some things may upset viewers. But as you know, I cover it as gently as possible. So if you're brand new here and you like true crime delivered to you in a way that maybe is a little bit more digestible and not so graphic, this is the place for you. I hope you'll consider subscribing. Make sure you hit the bell as well and turn all notifications on. Otherwise, you'll get upset when you miss a live stream. You say, I didn't get the notification, but you got to make sure it says all. Okay, and then if you're already a Grizzly, welcome back. It's so nice to see you back. I hope that you enjoyed part one and two. Oh man, I've been trying for the last few days to do this part three, but there's been so much news, which I also hope if you missed that, please check out um, all the live streams I did and the videos. There's been so much news in so many cases. It's been a bit of a struggle to keep up. Anyway, here we are, deep diving. Let's look at page three of Brian Laundrie's notepad. Okay, so let's dive right into it. We're starting from the top of what was released as page three. I've seen you guys bring up, there's quite a few of you have brought up the speculation of what if he wrote page one last? You know the, the part that he wrote for Gabby? What if he wrote that last? And some have even speculated what if he wrote that at a different time entirely, like at a time of a breakup? That's interesting. You see, we could analyze this all together <laughs> all day long because it's definitely interesting to consider the possibilities seeing as we don't know the exact precise timeline i hope that now that there is the possibility of a jury trial um if you missed that update yes the the petito lawyer has won that where as in the laundries um asking to dismiss the motion uh, for the civil suit was denied by the judge. So it seems as though, I know that uh, some have brought up, I don't have legal experience, but some of the Grizzlies have brought up that they could still actually dismiss it. I don't know. It seems to me that they're going to proceed with a jury trial because it's set for, if you look at the Sarasota County Clerk records and things, it seems to be set for uh, August 14th, 2023. So it is a long wait. Anyway, so maybe then we'll know more about the precise timeline because some things still don't make sense. But let's just um, let's just look at it page by page so that we could try our best to understand when he wrote it, how he wrote it, and what on earth he's even trying to say. Because even though most of it is BS and some people will not analyze it because they're like, what a load of BS. I want to analyze it because I think uh, if it comes to if Brian Laundrie was a narcissist, if he was uh, speculatively a pathological liar, or anything like that, or a coward, <laughs> all of that, there's still going to be like a, there's still going to be little nuggets of truth in what he writes. So that's what I'm very interested in, in, you know, what his version of events are and what really happened. It's going to be interesting to really unpack that once we really know. Anyway, so he wrote here, they loved as much, if not more than me. So if you remember, page two ended with his parents. This is a shock to his parents as well and a terrible grief. So here he says, they loved as much, if not more than me. That is already a hmm. So he describes Gabby as the love of his life. However, he's here saying that his parents might actually love, might have loved her more than he more than he did, which is so crazy. <laughs> it's just such an exaggerating and such an exaggerated statement, right? They loved as much, if not more than me, as if they're these amazing loving people, which we have not seen. We have not seen that side of them at all, right? A new daughter 
to my mother, an aunt to my nephews. So this to me is interesting because you can definitely see there's a strong bond that he had to his mother, more so than what I've witnessed with his dad. I don't want to really say too much speculating about Chris Laundry. I don't want to say because we don't know, but I would assume that Brian Laundry has endured some trauma in his life. And it just seems to me there's similarities I can draw from other cases I've studied where I'm like, huh, you know, maybe, maybe the dad was quite strict. Let's say that quite hard on him. Hmm? And so mommy was there as the softener. Mommy was there to write the letters, you know, burn after reading and say, I'll cover up for you. I'll help you. I'll, you know, all that kind of stuff. So to say a new daughter to my mother, <laughs> not to my father, just to my mother, new daughter to my mother. Okay. An aunt to my nephews. What about a sister-in-law or a sister to my sister? He has no connection from his letters to his sister. That's pretty evident. Or his father. Interesting. And of course, he doesn't talk about any other family members. So only his mother and his nephews. That's who was important to him. And we can kind of see that. I know his Instagram is now deleted. But remember, he did post photos with his nephews. Even the last photo of him alive from Fort DeSoto, remember that, if that was taken at the time, which Cassie shared and said this was taken at the time. So if we assume that's true, was him with his nephews. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that Fort DeSoto trip was also maybe time for him to see his nephews for the last time. It could be as simple as that. Like, let's meet over there and you could see them for the last time. And off he went to the preserve. Probably the family thinking, um, yeah, you're going to hide out for a while. And don't worry, we'll help you. You know, if they catch you, we'll help you. I think that's what the letter was about. Go and hide out there um, in the Big Slough Preserve or the Mayakachi Creek Environmental Park. Go hide out there. We know it's your favorite spot. He had a, 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 um, a tent, flares, all kinds of like camping stuff, you know, camping equipment. If you missed that, we did a full read through of his autopsy, like literally every page. Um, I made visual uh, representations and presentations for you so that you can easily remember all the items that were found and from exactly which distance from his skeletal remains. So that's why I'm referring to the tent. If you didn't know, he had a tent there, he did. He had a tent and flares and everything and a little box with photographs. And then of course the notepad. So, um, you know, I think that they met up at Fort DeSoto thinking, okay, he's going to go away. Uncle Brian's going away for a little while. No one knowing they're never going to see Uncle Brian again. Man, I feel so sorry for those kids, uh, for Cassie's children. They must be so traumatized by all of this. They lost Auntie Gabby. They lost Uncle Brian. They lost their grandparents because Cassie said that her parents are not talking to her anymore. Wow. So then he says, please do not make this harder for them. Okay. <laughs> right. Please do not make this harder for them. But them, he would be referring then to his mother and nephews. Okay. Or his parents from the previous sentence from page two. Please do not make this harder for them. This, again, he calls it this. He refers to the murder as this. <laughs> Many times in this notepad. This occurred as an unexpected tragedy. You wish it was an unexpected tragedy, Brian? An unexpected tragedy? Is that what you call murder? Well, many murderers do, don't they? It's, this is an unexpected tragedy. I just don't know. I was just being so merciful by taking your life. No. It's not an unexpected tragedy. In fact, it's grimly part of the statistics of DV. Sadly, it's like 20% of DV cases from what we looked at prior, uh, some of the stats in America, result in homicide. That's scary. So actually, it's not an unexpected tragedy. It was almost a trajectory of behavior that the, the Moab police certainly... Um, <laughs> I don't know, I'm careful with my words. They definitely uh, identified the wrong aggressor. Huh? Hmm? Yes, anyway... I'm not blaming them for what Brian did. Brian did what he did. He is solely responsible for his own 
actions and unfortunately you're such a coward he took his own life so now he will never face that punishment or do the time or anything like that but still i just want to say that yeah in dv cases mm, unfortunately there is a trajectory oftentimes there is an escalation of behavior as i think it was dr phil that once said it's not gonna get better like get out get out of that relationship if you can safely don't just run or whatever we've spoken about that before we did a whole episode on dv so check that out if you missed it but um yeah it's not going to get better it's usually going to get worse okay so he says rushing back to our car trying to cross the streams of spread creek before it got too dark to see too cold now i do understand that temperatures drop there at night especially you know, in that area and at the time of year and all that. Um, but rushing back to our car is the part I don't understand. Like, already that is very much like it's a movie in his mind as if, like, rushing back. I mean, it's not far. It's a 10-minute walk at max. So there's no rushing needed. You know, and he's a... He was an avid hiker. He'd be okay. And where's your flashlight, bro? <laughs> rushing back to our car trying to cross the streams of spread creek before it got too dark to see and too cold one you'd have a torch two what were you doing out there if you say you're rushing back three too dark to see too cold then why would you build a fire out there have a tarp out there and possibly the tent out there it doesn't make any sense so what I really um, speculate here and we'll have to show the little trigger bunny because I'm going to talk about the crime for a second if if I really think about what he's saying here I think he was rushing back to the car I think that he speculatively murdered Gabby in the van already when we saw that van door closing and all that on the 27th it says now in the legal document Gabby Petito was murdered on August 27th. That's the same day that they were seen fighting at the Mary Piglet's Tex-Mex restaurant. Which means that sometime later that afternoon, you know, somewhere between the Mary Piglet's Tex-Mex restaurant and Spread Creek Dispersed Camp, or maybe even while parking there, he murdered Gabby. So if he waited for it to get dark and was closing the door like he did and all of that, mm-hmm. I think if he went out there when it was dark and carried her across the creek, which I think he would be able to do. I know the whole thing about dead weight, but I think he'd be able to do it. He was extremely petite and very light. I think he could do it. So if he was, but, but let's just say maybe it was a little bit of a struggle for him, which is why he describes that in a moment. But if he carried her across the creek and then put a little you know, made a little fire. Hmm? Maybe they had camped there for a few days, so that's why the little fire pit was there. But if he rushed back there, as in he carried her, left her body there, and then he was rushing back to the car. Hmm? Rushing back to the car, trying to cross the streams of Spread Creek before it got too dark to see, too cold. No, so that it was too dark to see. So that it was too cold for other people to just be walking around there, whatever. Maybe he's just like, okay, i got to get out of here. Right? He says, I could hear a splash and a scream. Brian Internet has some great footage. It's on Twitter, it's on News Nation, and it's him walking across the creek. It's ankle deep. So, a splash and a scream. I think that's his own feet making the splash. The scream, I don't know what he's talking about. Maybe it's his own internal voice screaming. I could barely see. I couldn't find her for a moment, shouted her name. So there he doesn't say, I shouted her name. So I could barely see. I couldn't find her for a moment, shouted her name. <laughs> Just that one I that's not there <laughs> makes it feel like that last sentence is like, yeah, right. You definitely didn't shout her name. You were as silent as possible. You could probably hear, you know, the splashing and things like that. Uh -huh. Maybe you even heard a scream of like, hey, what are you doing out there? Are you okay? You never know if someone, wow, if there's a witness out there, if you, if you guys saw or heard something, whoa. But the thing is, hear a splash and scream. I could barely see. I couldn't find her for a moment. Did you drop her or what do you mean? And then he says, shattered her name. 
I found her breathing heavily. Now, the next sentence is the most narcissistic thing I could imagine him possibly saying. Gasping my name. She was freezing cold. I'm going to speculate again because she was dead. There's some truth in what he's writing here. We had just come from the blazing hot national parks. No, he hadn't. <laughs> no, he hadn't. And it's not that far from the blazing hot national parks in Utah. We're going to go to the next page now. But that's in his mind. They had just come from there. Yes, we also saw the body cam footage. Yes, we did. So in his mind, there's not this trip in between that he did. Hmm. It's like, we just come from there. It's his timeline now. Why? You see what I mean? He's, he's hiding. That trip between the 17th and the 23rd is still the most interesting part of this entire case for me. Because I'm like, what the hell was he doing? What was he doing? What did he do to Gabby? What did his mother do? Is that when she wrote the letter? And why would Bertolino even come out and talk about it? We do have to. I was talking to a friend about this case. We talk this case behind the scenes all day long. <laughs> We're like, oh my word, remember this. Oh my word, remember that. Because he has also worked in the media and also has a, a memory like mine, I suppose. And then we go over these little moments of like, wait, 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 wait. Remember that. And like, wait a minute. So, I mean, why would Bertolino come forward with that information of like, no, no, no. He just, he flew home during that time. There is a lot of mystery surrounding that time between the 17th and the 23rd. And here he's saying we had just come from the blazing hot national parks. But you hadn't. You went home in between. You, you didn't just come from there. You went home in between. Okay. <laughs> then returned to Salt Lake City in Utah. So not even the national parks. You returned to the hotel where Gabby was staying, Salt Lake City. She was allegedly seen checking out on the 24th. Then you went straight to this, well, kind of straight. I just mean north. You went to Spread Creek Disperse Camp. So we had just come from, mm, mm, interesting. Let's look at the next page. Um, but before I do, I want to show you something very interesting, which you may have forgotten. Okay, are you ready? All right. I hope you guys are enjoying these deep dives. I know these are quite long videos, but it's a deep dive. Okay, let me show you this. Do you guys remember this? Brian Laundry seen scouting the area where Gabby Petito's body was found on August 26th, 27th, 28th, and 28th. This article was published on September 22nd, 2021. Yes, three days after her body was found. Brian Laundry seen scouting the area where Gabby Petito's body was found on August 26th, the day before he murdered her. On August 27th, the day he murdered her. And the 28th, so he went to check on her remains. Whoa. Let's quickly have a look at this. Grand Teton National Park, Wyoming. With Gabby Petito confirmed dead and her fiancé Brian Laundry on the run, mystery is intensifying in the Van Leifer vlogger case that has rattled the nation and the world. While searches are on for the 23-year-old Laundry, a person of interest in the murder case, a shocking claim has been made by the tipster who helped the police find Petito's body. According to Jessica Schulz, and we did look at her all her videos, um, I believe it was on TikTok, so if you missed out on that, please check out my Gabby Petito or Brian Laundry playlist. Uh, Jessica Schulz, 38. Okay, according to her, Brian Laundry was seen behaving in a creepy manner and acting weird around the area where Gabby Petito's remains were eventually found. The graphic designer, who lives out of an Airstream caravan around the Wyoming campsite, informed the FBI that she spotted the couple's 2012 Ford um, Transit van in the Grand Teton National Forest multiple times in late August. She eventually aided the police to locate Petito's body near the campsite. Okay, so... I'm just, this is a reminder, we've deep dived that one already, but uh, she also was. Red, White and Bethune helped tremendously, but Jessica Schulz also helped because she was in contact with the FBI 
And she said, wait a minute, I know the exact area. I saw him scouting out this area and just acting creepy. The way she saw him behaving, the way he parked the van, which I believe was on the 27th. She said it was so weird. And she was like waiting to see like, uh, uh, what are you going to do? She was trying to like pass him and he was like busy parking. And she like kind of waved and she said he was alone. So Gabby was speculatively in the back of the van, you know, possibly very injured or no longer alive. Oh boy. So, hmm. 26th, 27th and 28th. Okay, now let's continue. Okay, so this page starts with in Utah because it follows on from the previous page, which says we just got back from the, we just come from the blazing hot national parks in Utah. The temperature had dropped to freezing and she was soaking wet. I worry about that because it feels like it might be because he dropped her in the water while trying to carry her across the creek. I carried her as far as I could down the stream. Now he says towards the car. I believe he means away from the car. Stumbling, it's just one change of a word. Away from the car changes everything. You see what I mean? Away from the car. Mm. Well, away from, towards, away from, two words. Some people be like, that's two words. Okay. Away from the car, stumbling, exhausted, in shock. Why in shock? Because you murdered her? When my knees buckled and I knew I couldn't safely carry her. I started a fire and spooned her as close to the heat. She was so thin. I think he started a fire to make it look like when he left her out there, that it's just someone that he left out there. They were camping. They had a breakup, which could be when he wrote the first page. He might've even written the first page of this notebook or notepad that was released at the breakup point, maybe even between the 17th and the 23rd. However, focusing on this, I think he carried her away from the car in shock across the stream, maybe dropped her in the water, couldn't find her for a moment, picked her up again, carried on. It must have been exhausting, sure. And then knees buckling, knew couldn't safely carry her, huh? Started a fire, yes, to make it look like the campsite thing. And then the fake texts come in because then he texted for days between his phone and her phone, therefore simulating what I believe would be a breakup. So that it's like, fine, you stay out there with your friends. You stay out there with your new man. I'm going to just take our van back home and I'm just going to stay there and you find your own way home. Something like that is what I would speculate he may have said. But how sickening is it that he actually did that? Oh my word. Wow. But then he says, I started a fire and spooned her as close to the heat. I worry about him saying as close to the heat, like how close did he put her to the heat? to try to destroy evidence. She was so thin. Again, I speculate that in between the 17th and the 23rd, he possibly left her stranded at the Fairfields in its suites at Salt Lake, in Salt Lake City, um, possibly. And maybe she didn't have that much access to food as much as she could have freeloaded on the buffet. We've already kind of gone over this, but she was so thin. She could have been so thin from that very terrible time that she had at that hotel the way that he left her. And I would speculate he already left her in a condition, maybe not even on her face because she did FaceTime with her parents and everything apparently. And they didn't say any, just because they didn't say, we don't know, but they didn't apparently say that she, I mean, they would have obviously panicked if she looked a certain way, but maybe it already, maybe you even tied her up. Remember when he said her hands, he's going to say it um, any minute, her hands hurt and her feet hurt. Maybe he tied her up. Or something. I don't know. We don't know what exactly the sicko did. But to say she was so thin. Mm -hmm, had already been freezing too long. Yeah. Because I speculate she was already dead for quite a few hours. Now she's cold and dead weight. I couldn't at the time realize. That I should have started a fire first. It's a weird way to say that, but I wanted her out of the cold back to the car. I think if we really read the honest truth of that, I wanted her out of the car. <laughs> you know, I couldn't at the time realize I should have st started a fire first. Yeah, that might have been easier for you to, I don't know, navigate your way in the dark to the campsite is what I'm thinking that means while carrying her. Mm -hmm. 
Should have started that damn fire first. Would have been so much easier in the dark to find our campsite. While carrying her and not being able to hold a torch and her at the same time or something like that. Anyway, and they're saying, but I wanted her out of the cold back to the car. I'm going to speculate. I know I'm speculating a lot, but that's what we do sometimes just because this is a lot of BS, right? So I would speculate again, trigger warning, that he means I wanted her cold body out of the car, not her out of the cold back to the car. I wanted her cold out of the car, possibly. From where I started the fire, I had no idea how far the car might be. That's a lie. <laughs> it's a 10 minute walk, number one. Two, you could probably see it, but yes, we understand it was dark. This might be his way of explaining away why, in case there would be forensic evidence or something, maybe he's paranoid at this point, why he stayed with her remains overnight. Because he may have. Yes, because did he not leave? He left on the 29th. On the 28th, he was hitchhiking to Calter Bay Village. So he may have actually spooned her. We don't know how sick this guy could be. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to go there, but it could be really bad. Like a lot of other true crime cases we see. He could be... Uh, I'm not going to go there. Just really bad. So the point is... Spooning her close to the heat, he might have actually been out there with her remains that night, thinking, now I can't go back to the car or whatever, I don't know. But then he went to Colter Bay Village, walking on the 28th or so, getting two, hitching two rides back to camp, saying, you wait, you just drop me at the gate, bye-bye, thank you so much. Walked the rest of the way to the car, got in the car and left. Okay, so, hmm, let's look at the next page. So he only knew it was across the creek. When I pulled Gabby out of the water, she couldn't tell me what hurt. Probably because she was no longer with us. She had a small bump on her forehead that eventually got larger. I think that's the way he's trying to explain away what they might find if they ever found her body. He was hoping they would never find her body. So. She had a small bump on her forehead that eventually got larger. Her feet hurt. Her wrist hurt. But she was freezing. Shaking violently. While carrying her, she continually made sounds of pain. Laying next to her, she said little. Lapsing between violent shakes. Gasping in pain. Begging for an end to her pain. I feel like there is the possibility that he did something to her involving blunt force trauma and that this could be possible. However, my gut feels telling me that he murdered her in the van and then carried her across the creek. So if we were to consider that option, that's what I mean, we could go through like four options each time. But if we were to explore that option, um, of course, if you want me to explore many other options, I could, I could, I could do that. But if I were to just for a second speculate that he murdered her in the van and carried her across the creek to say her feet hurt and her wrist hurt. I wonder if that's from dropping her or if in some way he it's from the way he was trying to carry her by like one foot and one arm or something like dragging her if he tried to pick her up or something. I don't know. Her feet hurt, her wrist hurt or as I speculated, we don't know what State he left her in at the Fairfields in a suite. But she was freezing, shaking violently. I think this is him now. I think he was freezing. He was shaking violently. So much anger, so much pain. While carrying her, I think that he continually made sounds of pain. Laying next to her, she said little. I think laying next to her, he said little. He was lapsing between violent shakes. I think that he was gasping in pain, frustration, anger, and just like, oh my word, what do I do now? And I think that he might have been begging for an end to his own pain. The own dilemma that he put him, that he put himself in of like, what the F do I do? And remember, he called Mama the next day, the very next day. Possibly, I would speculate, in the morning. You know, knowing his mother's routine and when she would wake up, he would call her in the morning. And say, I effed up. Gabby's dead. I need help. 
And that day, she called Bertolino. And by September 1st, the retainer was paid to Bertolino. And wow, the rest is history, right? In that regard. So she would fall asleep. And I would shake her awake. Fearing she shouldn't close her eyes if she had a concussion. In my opinion, I think that he would fall asleep, lapsing almost in and out of psychosis. And that he would wake up and then shake her violently, trying to get her awake in a way. Like, come on, come on, come on. Like, this can't be it. Not because he cares about her, because he cares about the consequences of what he just did. Fearing she shouldn't close her eyes if she had a concussion. She would wake in pain, start the whole painful cycle again, while furious that I was the one waking her. I think that he would wake up freezing, angry, in pain, sad, all kinds of stuff, mixed emotions, right? Just panic, I'm sure. Paranoia, panic, everything. So I think that he would wake up in pain, start this whole painful cycle again, maybe even be furious with her, like, look what you made me do. That's what I'm thinking. Well, Fury said I was the one waking her. <laughs> or are you expressing a little bit of your own rage there? That he was furious. That she made him do this. Because he blames her a lot throughout this notepad. Okay, and finally for this episode, if we look at page 6. He says, uh, what we just read, she would wake in pain. Start the, start the whole painful cycle again. While furious that I was the one waking her. Okay. Then... She wouldn't let me try to cross the creek. Thought, like me, that this fire would go out in her sleep. And she'd freeze. So, are you saying that you were out there trying to keep the fire going? And that she were, you put her really close to the heat? Trying to destroy evidence? That he couldn't just, at that point, just leave. He was afraid. Of her being discovered the way that he left her. He had to make sure. <laughs> that he kept that fire going. I don't know the extent of Gabby's injuries. Oh yeah, do. Oh but you do. You know them so well. You know them intimately. Mm -hmm. He means. I don't know when you guys are going to find her body. Or if ever. But remember he. He allegedly wrote this when he was out at Mayakahachi Creek. So he left home on the 13th. I say it like that because that's according to Berlino. The Mustang was back at home on the 15th. On the 17th, he was officially reported missing. However, on the 17th was also the day that neighbors around the laundry home in the community saw someone who looked just like Brian leaving on foot with a backpack. And if you go and look at previous articles of exactly when Brian Laundrie was reported missing, everybody reported it and said they left on foot. So the whole Mustang story came in later. And I find that that's kind of what the Berlin, what Berlino and the Laundries do. They muddy the waters with more and more information, layers of, I would say, deception. I think that the parents took the Mustang out to the creek and then collected it you know, possibly as part of this whole setup to get him out the country eventually or something to help him out. Like you hide out there, we'll take the car there, we fetch the car and then we'll just say, Ooh, we don't know where you went. But they actually didn't know where maybe he was on the 17th. And speculatively, why do I say the 17th? She was officially reported missing on the 11th. On the 17th, he goes out speculatively, according to my own personal opinion, let's say the 17th, he goes out to the creek on foot and on the 19th, they find her body. I think that's the day he would have taken his own life. And he knew that weekend, oh crap, they're searching for her. So, which is why he wrote this. That's what I think, speculatively. Okay, I could be wrong and you're allowed to disagree. Remember, we're just thinking out loud together. So, to say, I don't know the extent of Gabby's injuries. You don't know the condition in which they'll find her, if they do. And you didn't realize, <laughs> I think it was on the 17th as well, that Red, White and Bethune shared their footage with the world. The 17th, you see? Now he was crapping himself. Witnesses came forward. Red, White and Bethune saw exactly where the van was. That's not something he would have ever guessed would have happened. I mean, none of us really would have, right? But thank goodness for all of it. Um, so to say, I don't know the extent of her injuries. Yeah. 
you don't know what they're going to know about the extent of her injuries. Only that she was in extreme pain. I ended her life. Amazingly, now there's no details. And I say that because he's been very detailed before. The gasping my name. You know, going in and out of waves of pain. Her being furious and all the stuff he's just said. But at the most critical moment, he says, I ended her life. I thought I was merciful. So instead of saying, I ended her life. <laughs> I can't even, I can't even. He doesn't say, I strangled her. It was quick. Nothing like that. He says, I ended her life because it's, it's not quick. I'm just saying, he says, I ended her life. I thought it was merciful. No. No, no. The, with his view of the world and human beings being parasites and basically vermin, with that type of thinking, he might have thought he's doing the world a favor by getting rid of someone like Gabby. In his mind, he might have thought that. That's maybe what he means by I thought it was merciful. Someone who... He, he would hate the whole social media thing. Someone who just cares about... Remember what he wrote in that post? Do you remember that one of those... I think it was his final Instagram post about the tree. He wrote about this tree that doesn't need anything. Just like sun and water and air or whatever. He doesn't, it doesn't need um, any Starbucks coffees or frappes. It doesn't need technology. It doesn't need social media. It doesn't need brand names. You remember what I, You remember? We looked at that. Okay, so for him to say, I thought it was merciful. Hmm... Okay, I think that's his resentment he's expressing there. I thought it's merciful to just, we don't need more of these types of people in the world. That is what she wanted. <laughs> never, never, bro. Mm -mm. She wanted, very likely, to end it with you. Okay, then. Uh, but I now see all the mistakes. Oh, now you see that murder is maybe a mistake. Oh. I now see all the mistakes I made. Okay. Meaning you didn't see it before. All the DV, you know, leading up to that moment, didn't see those mistakes. All the control, the possessive behavior, the way you chipped away at her entire identity. Like, literally, we could see from the beginning to the end of her relationship with him, how he chipped away at her self-worth. You could actually physically see it. It's very sad to see. Um, so to say, I now see all the mistakes I made. Oh, only now. Why? Because they're out there searching for her body. Oh, now I see all the mistakes I made. I panicked. I was in shock. Eh, it's probably more like I was raging and blacked out and then I was in shock. Like, damn, what did I do? I panicked. I was in shock. There's no justification for murder. But from the moment I decided took away her pain, I knew I couldn't go on without her. Oh, you mean from the moment she decided she didn't want to be with you anymore, speculatively? You decided, if I can't have you, no one else can. The usual, right? And I knew I couldn't go on without her. That might be true but he's angry about it you see okay so that was a very <laughs> big deep dive into page three four five and six in the next episode we'll finish this up by looking at page seven and eight and i will then show you some um, information from a handwriting analyst so i'm very excited for that thank you so much to the grizzly sarah who sent us that I've had it ready for you. I just wanted to make sure we work through this. In the next episode, we're going to look at page 7, 8, handwriting analysis on top of that, and then reflect on everything that we have deep dived and see if it matches up to what the analyst is saying. I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much for being here. Please give this video a thumbs up. Make sure you share it. Make sure you are subscribed. Even if you were subscribed before, make sure you are still subscribed because sometimes it can happen. Technology, AI, whatever will unsubscribe you. So make sure you subscribe. Hit the bell. Make sure it's not set to none or personal. Make sure it's set to all so that you don't miss out on upcoming live streams or breaking news live streams or uploads or things like that. 
And then please leave your comments below. I really look forward to reading your thoughts. Of course, I'm only one person. And yes, I have people helping me, but still, we can't get to all the comments. There's a lot of comments and I definitely, my favorite thing to do is to read through them. So sometimes I manage to, you know, like them and heart them. I do my best to do that as much as possible. But just know I scroll through those comments and I read them all. So please leave your comments and thoughts below. I look forward to reading it. And lastly, please check out grizzlytruecrime.com for all links for everything that you could possibly want, which could be the Patreon, the ways to support the channel. It could be merch links, book links, all that kind of stuff. And there's also a contact form there, which uh, you could fill in if you want to reach me via email easily. All right. So I will see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching and stay safe.